Good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we're here with another of our virtual events. And uh, this evening, we have our good friend Ellen Crosby joining us once again to talk about her brand new wine country mystery, Bitter Roots. I don't know if you can see that cover. Beautiful cover. Yeah. And uh, she signed a, a bunch of books for us. Sorry, this light is kind of plaguing me. Um, and I'll go ahead and put a link to uh, the autographed copies in the notes field or the comments field. Uh, should you wish to order one? And if you have questions for Ellen, just go ahead and put them in and Barbara will summon me back on screen towards the end of the hour. So Barbara, we have our well-rehearsed little spiel down, don't we? We really do. I was just admiring that you're word perfect. I'm so impressed. So <laughs> in, indeed, this is a beautiful cover. And unfortunately, the lighting is not terrific. But I did think, I love the glass of wine. It's so beautiful. I was going to actually have a glass of wine. I'm dressed in wine, you see. You, I, I you are. I that. And I was going to have a glass of wine. And then I looked again at the book and realized it's not a red wine. And the white wine, if I drink it, looks like water. So <laughs> I have water. So, you know. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Can we raise, raise a, a toast? Yes, let's. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Toast back. for Barbara. Yeah. I, I have been here something. for every book, Barbara. Every book oh, I've written. That's and true. I, yeah, and it's really yeah. been a great pleasure. And I love this wine country series. And one of the reasons I like it so well, aside from the characters and the plot, is that Ellen, who is a, is a journalist at heart, as well as a, as a author of fiction, uh, really does her research. And so you always get to learn things. And I, I find the whole wine industry fascinating and, and its roots in Virginia. If you spend any time at all in Virginia, particularly if you've ever gone to Monticello where Thomas Jefferson tried very hard to to grow grapes right. stock he brought back from france never did prosper right. yeah of course climate change now means that they're they're growing wine they're growing wine grapes in scotland so yeah. yeah yeah it's so weird but anyway um i think you've done a wonderful job and before we're done um, let's talk about your other character whom i very much like from moscow nights and what's going on with her Oh, wow. Um, so, wow, that's a long time ago, Barbara. I wrote that book in the, you, you mean Claire um, uh, Brennan from the, from Moscow Nights? Well, aren't you doing, aren't you doing? No, something? I'm doing the Sophie books. That's a different oh, one. Oh, it's Sophie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Right, right, okay. right. Well, there, but well, you know what? Perfect. That book was also had a little bit about Russia in it. And I was thinking about that today because um, um, the first book, uh, Multiple Exposure, um, Sophie had been in, she was living in London and her husband was uh, in, in a, a pro, uh, uh, an area of Russia that I, in, that I invented um, where they discovered oil. And so I ended up doing a lot of research on the, the oligarchs in London and, you know, and, who, and it, there wasn't a whole lot known, you know, even seven or eight years ago about the oligarchs. And of course, now you hear just about everything about them, their yachts and their, you know, their, their fabulous homes and everything else. But um, yeah, it's you know the what's what's happening now. It, when we lived in when we lived in the Soviet Union, a lot all the all the journalists, all of us who were kind of there, we sort of have all started you know reaching out to each other. And for us, having lived in Moscow, I mean, what's happening in Ukraine is just so awful. And it was when it was the Soviet Union. I mean, Andre, my husband's last trip before we came home was to to Kiev, and and so it was one of the Soviet republics. But we we were living in the Soviet Union when there was a time of so much hope for it. It was the Gorbachev era. It was, you know, sort of the end of the Soviet Union, the end of communism. I mean, things were opening up. Um, you know, you were starting to get things coming in from the West and, and the possibility of more freedom of the press. And so to see this 30 years, you know, just go back to what it was in the Cold War and just how how scary it is to see almost like a Stalinist figure, you know, uh, having, having this you know, the, the world in its sprawl is, it's just, it's, it's just so scary. One of the journalists who, um, I was the radio correspondent for ABC News, and so one of the television correspondents, when we all lived there, our, all of our kids were really young, and so the other day, he put together, um, like, a whole clip of some of his television stories for ABC back, you know, then Peter Jennings, and, you know, it was like back 30-some years ago, and he sent it to his daughters, who are now my kids' age, and their, and their husbands, and then I sent it to our sons because they were all little kids in, in Russia and said, this is what it was like when you lived there. And the kids, you know, they just can't even imagine what it was like. It was just such a different world. And it's, it's, it just, uh, we just can't stop watching television. I mean, it's just, you can't watch, you can't look away. 
Well, I thought the New York Times, I think it was the Times, did a really good job of this article about you yes. know how Putin in 21 years or whatever mm -hmm. has morphed from what looked like a statesman and the opportunity yeah. for yeah. you know Russia to really be a yeah. leader in the global community to some clone of Hitler. Like and, that, okay, know, I think, yeah. I think yeah. it's the aging process. I think you know it's a desperate grab for power. Is all klepto I read, and I think it's true that all kleptocracies eventually come to an end. And you know, and they don't generally go pretty into that good night. And so yeah. here we are, you know, one man's ego, basically, yeah. and a great deal of misinformation. Um, but he also big. he didn't. But you know, um, Andre, my husband was a, he studied Soviet studies when they were both at Johns Hopkins, and so he know, and he's also Russian. His grandmother was Ukrainian, and his, his grandfather was Russian. So I mean, you know, we he said that there were so many things that that we let Putin get away with. I mean, that, you know, that he took Crimea and he, you know, he's, he came in and he's already done things and didn't think that he was going to get, he was going to have any problems with it. And he was, he reminded me tonight, he said the rest of Japanese war, the Russians went in in 1905 and thought they were just going to mop up. And he said, you know, the Japanese just, you know, just, 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 they, they, they won. And he said, that's when Teddy Roosevelt came in and um, brokered the deal that got him the Nobel Peace Prize, which I had completely forgotten about. So, you know, it's history repeating itself, you know, it's, yeah, well, that's very true. Hard word to talk about. Sorry, I started yeah. this old aggression. I we to talk about wine, wine in Virginia, the wine country yeah. mysteries. And yes. this is um, for several books. We've been working our way towards a wedding. We have been yes. working our way towards Lucy Montgomery and Quinn Santana, her winemaker, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, merging their lives and their skills. And so here we are now, you know, because this is a mystery, you absolutely know when you pick this up and the wedding's in progress, that Ellen is going to find a way to derail it. And sure well, enough, she does. I couldn't write the wedding book, you know, I mean, that was like, I'm just not going to do it. And I had sort of dragged my feet through six books and I thought, all right, I have to get married. So to not write the wedding book, I thought, well, you know, something has to go wrong. And um um, I don't know who, if any, you know, whoever might be watching, if any of you ever were in DC in 2012, when the derecho came through, this was the most unbelievable storm to hit Washington DC in a generation, I think. And it just, it just absolutely flattened the city. It came through with no warning. Um, and so I thought, well, how about a derecho in my book? So I, you know, I pretty much everything that happened in that book is exactly what happened to us. Um, there was, you know, there was no power, there was no water. Um, the really scary thing is I live in Fairfax County, Virginia, which is, um, you know, we're on the, we're on the, the um, edge of Washington, you see the CIA is there, um, the Pentagon's in the next county over, but we're, you know, we're right, you know, in, in sort of metro Washington, and we've got one of the best um, police departments, and we have, uh, you know, we have uh, helicopters, and we, and we send people to, to take care of, you know, to earthquake victims and stuff like that. It, the whole system was just knocked out. And not only was the whole system knocked out, the whole backup system was knocked out. There was no 911 for days. And we had a wind up radio. And so we were listening to the, you know, to the all news station. They said, well, pretty much drive to the police department, <laughs> drive to the fire department and say, hey, <laughs> could you, I mean, it was really, really scary. And so you, you know, then gradually, um, uh, gas stations started, you know, when, when they're like, when they're, when they ran out of gas, there was no way to replenish it. So we started having gas lines, stores just threw open their doors, like grocery stores. Um, and when everything was gone and it, it had all rotted, I mean, there was just nothing. So I remember being in, in a grocery store, like 10 days after this whole thing happened. And one of the managers came over to the clerk and he, and he said to her, if anybody comes in here and needs ice, don't charge them, just give it to them. It was horrible. So I, you know, climate change is coming. So I, I brought it to Rachel. And uh, well, I'm, I'm sure that more storms are in the offing. Thank um, you. That, I feel good now. <laughs> we have one today. And, you know, uh, we That's actually put a generator in um, last year after watching California and the California fires and the effect. I yeah. said to my husband, you know, in Arizona, if you lose your power in the summer for more than a day, you can you could lose your whole house, you know, because the heat's so extreme. And yeah. I thought, yeah. you know, we should really put in a generator of our own. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you know, and it comes on. In fact, it just it just did come on a little while ago because it tests itself every week. Wow. And I feel marginally better with yeah. you know with that as backup. But 
it's amazing how dependent we are now upon systems and the electric grid. And I'll tell you what I found really interesting. I think I was talking to Joe Cannon about it, but Spycraft has gone back to old Spycraft because of hacking and the vulnerability of the internet and so forth. And so, um, you know, when you when you used to write a note and hide it in a newspaper and pass it on a park bench or, yeah. you know, hide it in a tree or, you know, yeah. whatever yeah. it all is, you can't yeah. hack that. And, um, you know, and I think it's interesting that the more technologically dependent we become, the more old fashioned kind of, yeah. you know, um, old school yeah. ways of doing things like driving to the police station, or, yeah. Yeah. as you point out. One of the um, drops for that, for the, um, what was his name, Robert Hansen was right near my kid's school. And it was in a park right near the school. And he just used to go over and leave things by a stone and they'd find it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's an interesting question for thriller writers and stuff, you know, is that you get all geared up thinking, you know, everything's going to go so high tech, but in fact, you know, it may kind of reverse itself. But aside from the storm, which disrupts the wedding, that's not really going to be the murder no. um, that, you know, is going to be part of the plot. But the real tragedy for this story is not actually the death of the person. Well, it is, but, you know, another tragedy. Let me rephrase that is what's happening to a swath of grapes. So, you know, you did a wonderful job describing it on pages 20 and 21, but why don't you, why don't you tell us what plague has arrived? Okay, well, actually what happened was, um, if, you, if anybody goes to my website, there, there's always sort of a header and there's in one of my, the books, and I, 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 the, the pictures are always mine. So for the last book for um, The French Paradox, um, the picture was of a vineyard called Delaplane Cellars, um, in Delaplane, Plain, Virginia, and it's um, the, the winemaker there is my, um, has been for years been my wine advisor. And so that was the picture, and it's gorgeous. I mean, it's really pretty, you know, it's typical Virginia with the rolling hills and the, and the lush vineyards and everything else. So we were talking, um, oh, well, I don't know, before I was writing this book, and he said to me, Ellen, you know that picture you have on your website? If you, if you came out and took that picture today, there would be this really ugly swath of dead vines, and he told me the story of what of what happened is they bought they bought the vines from a, you know from a, a, a grower, and they 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 planted them. And what what what's happened in America is that you you know you, you what you put in the ground is a different rootstock than the vine itself because the especially the the, the French vines you know they're very fragile, so you put like a really hardy um, root in, and you and you, um, you 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 put a seam. And so what happened was that this seam became infected and you never and what ha what happens is no one finds out th about the infection until like three years into when the grapes have been in the ground so you've had three years with no harvest you're waiting for your first harvest and all of a sudden everything starts to die and so rick was telling me about this and he talked about all the love they put into it all the time they put into it all the care they put into it all the people they'd had come out they fertilized they this and they that and he and the last thing he said to me is i could kill somebody and that's and i was like you know i think that's a book and, um, you know, and it's, you, he said, you just spend all this money and all this time. So then I started talking to a woman named Lucy Morton, um, who is actually sort of the inspiration for Lucy Montgomery, but she's one of the top wine, um, wine advi uh, advisors to vineyards in, in, in the U.S. and in France. And she's been helping me a lot. She lives in Charlottesville. And so she was telling me that, um, she was telling me that actually this, this, is, this happened in California in the 90s. So she told me the whole sordid story about what happened in California and how it, it just destroyed this very close-knit community of growers and, 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 and vineyard owners and people who'd be paid off and everything else. And I said to her, and she was actually out in California, so she knew the whole story. And I said, can I use that? And she said, well, it was a long time ago and everybody's dead, so you can. So all of what happened is based on what happened in California in the 1990s and what happened what happened here in Virginia. So it's all, there wasn't anything to make up. I just had them help me with the, the tech, not, you know, the, the technical terms and not get too, you know, too sort of dense and technical, but so that, you know, readers could kind of follow it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's it's climate change and you know it's it's affecting everything and that and wine is our food i mean it's you know maybe something we drink and for pleasure but more and more you know what's happening to our food well very true um but when you say destroy the community you know i mean obviously finances are part of it because you know there's a tremendous financial toll if you've invested in land and 
um, and buying vines in three years of time and all, and then there's no payoff. But is there also a real blame culture that goes on when this happens as well? Um, that's basically what happened in California. And there were people who were paid off and there's a university out there that was part of the, um, that was sort of invested in saying that these vines were okay. And I'm not even going to get into names, um, but it was, it got, it got very ugly. And, um, Lucy actually felt quite threatened. I mean, it was, it, it got, it got pretty extreme. So, um, like I said, when, when Josie, who's the character is Lucy in my book, um, she gets threatened. It was pretty much taken from, you know, the whole playbook, everything that Lucy told me that, you know, people will, will, will kill for this. I mean, it, it destroyed, um, it destroyed a, a farm, I mean, a, a, a farm that, um, that, that sold, sold vineyards in California. I mean, one of the biggest, um, um, uh, it's not a farm, but um, I forget what you call it, but anyway, it, it, they, it, they were absolutely destroyed and went out of business and um it was it was just horrible and you know it, it um, took a long time for people to sort of recover from that so what happened in my book is you know everybody's blaming everybody else and of course the growers are saying in three years you know we have no control over what happened you know you've got you've got climate change you've got all this you know you've got all these things going on and then you've got the pushback from the people who bought the grapes saying the you know the mines saying yeah but you knew you couldn't guarantee that these were that these were um, disease free. And so it's a lose lose situation. I mean, every, nobody wins in it. I mean, you, the, the grapes die anyway. And, um, and it's, it's, it's really hard. And I, I, the, you know, the longer I've gone on writing the series, the more stories I've heard about, you know, just, just these seasons of total, you know, the, the, where the climate's just so bad that things are just totally washed out, or there's all these pests that come in or whatever, and, you know, a hurricane will come through. And it's, it's, it's tough. It's really, really tough. There's more and more vineyards in Virginia. I mean, we drove down to Charlottesville for the Virginia Book Festival the week before last, and there were vineyards like everywhere. Um, but it's really, it's a really tough way to make a living. Well, but it's farming. I mean, you know, exactly. And, and farming, um, you know, for millennia has been subject to climate and disease and, you know, finances and market demand and all the same things. So it would certainly be true of wine. So what you're looking at to start out here, and maybe only is the Cabernet Franc grape. So mm -hmm. what is a Cabernet Franc grape? It is a, is it a noble grape? Now you see, now you're going to put me on the spot, but it's, um, it's a grape that does very, very well in Virginia and that and a, and a, and a grape called Viognier. And so it's, it's a slam dunk to grow this grape in Virginia. And so for it to die was a really big deal. So Virginia grows a lot of Cab Franc. And, so are we are we looking at at a white wine? Are we? Oh, it's a red. It's a red. It's a red. It's a red. Yeah. Well, that's why I was a little confused by the cover, which has the white I, wine. Oh well, yeah, I know. There and we I go. Know. Um, right. So you know, and I thought I thought that failure to thrive, because that's a that's a term that we uh -huh. we hear applied in other situations. It can be children. It can uh -huh. be a lot of things. But basically, what they're saying is when they first notice that the Cabernet Franc is dying. Mm -hmm. um, is that it's a failure to thrive, but then it gets worse. Um, and and I think the term black goo is particularly repulsive. The proper name is this unpronounceable thing. And then Lucy said to me, oh, we just call it black goo. And I was like, well, yeah, that, you know, that works. And, um, but she said what happens, and Rick was telling me that the, the, the winemaker, because Lucy's now um, advises his vineyard. And he said, you know, she came and she just, you know, she took her second turn and she just cut right through it. And this tarry stuff oozes out and it's supposed to be clear liquid, obviously, because nothing can get to the, to the, to the, to the leaves and, and nothing's going to grow. And he said, you're just heart sick. And he said, you just rip it out of the ground and you're done. And he said, it's just really, um, it's over. And so you either, you have to start again, you have to rip them out and start all over again. And um, the, the ironic thing is, and I think I explained this later in the book, that there was this pest called, uh, a louse called uh, phylloxera, which was a, a very tiny, tiny mite or something, where American vines were sent to Europe and, um, and they ended up infecting all the European vines and killing huge swaths of vines all throughout France and everything else. And so it was a it was a really big deal. And so they discovered that the only way to save the French vineyards was to take the rootstock of the exact same vines, the American the hardy American vines that had that had brought the louse over, and then graft them onto the French 
um, vines. So, so there's, there's a seam on these vines. And so now that's what they do in America is when they've got a Merlot or something, it's going to be Chardonnay, it's going to be fragile. They take a hardy rootstock from, from like a big American, you know, hybrid or something. And they put these beautiful French, um, the Merlot and, the, and, and, and Cap Sauvignon and all that. They graft them. But what happened is in saving vines from the phylloxera, they brought in this, this where the joints get infected. That's so they, they brought in yet another another uh, crisis for the vineyards. And so that's what's killing the vines now. And there's- Well, uh, there's a whole lesson here about globalization and yep. whether in fact, I've just finished Jim Rollins's new book. And what I mean, I'm gonna be talking to him in April, it doesn't come out till the 18th, but that's one of the things he's talking about is in Africa um, is, you know, when you bring something that has its own mm -hmm. um, ecosystem and so forth, and you move it to somewhere else, yeah. you're inviting disaster. And, you know, we can see all over the world where, you know, pests in, that that one part of the world can contain arrive largely through travel anymore, and how arrive in another part of the world. Yeah. It could be like the pythons in Florida or, yeah. you know, um, things that have attacked trees. I remember Dutch elm disease, you know, yeah. we lost all the chestnut trees and the chestnut yeah. blight. Um, and so when we do stuff like that, when we mess around with mother nature and her ecology, we can get some really terrible results and certainly it's been true in the wine industry both with the phylloxera and the black goo that black goo, yeah. moving vines back and forth uh, has new zealand do you know whether new zealand and australia have had to put up because or or argentina because those are big wine growing areas I, know. I think i think the phylloxera went to australia but the black goo i i it's it's, it's just kind of coming here now i think so i don't know if it's gotten there yet but i mean inevitably it's going to you know it probably um, will south africa too has a very healthy wine industry one of my favorite wines we now import it um is a rosé that we first drank in um in south africa oh, really north of cape town in um uh -huh. the dutch province i'm trying to remember how to pronounce it frangios or whatever it is anyway uh -huh. um and you know and wine growing is moving north as we earlier mentioned um yeah. i'm pretty sure iceland will have its own wine here it will it will yeah it will. it's crazy isn't um it? and then some of the the older vineyards and hotter climates may not may not thrive um yeah. because you know that it's going to be too tough for the grapes but they're dealing with that in France already because they're finding that some of the, you know, some of the grapes that grow better there are Spanish grapes. So what are you going to do in, you know, in, in, in Bordeaux? I mean, how are you going to, you know, you know, you know, I mean, how are you going to grow all, you know, bring these Spanish grapes to Bordeaux and start growing them there? Wow. What are they going to do? It's, it's really, it's, 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 a, it's, yeah, a, it's a huge question. And since terroir is such a major part of what distinguishes wine, you know, if you, if, as in Bordeaux or Champagne or wherever it is, you know, that particular climate, that particular soil, actually in vineyards, it can even change, you know, depending on the elevation, if there's a higher ground in the vineyard and a lower one, or if you have a south slope versus yeah. a, a north or an east or a west and all, all of that can really affect the taste yeah. of the grapes. But, you know, a place like Bordeaux, which is for centuries, had its own terroir and produced its own particular bouquet and taste and so forth Spanish grapes may you know may ruin that French and the Spanish grapes yeah really I mean and one of the things that's interesting about Virginia and I think I mentioned it in the book is you know you can just grow anything here I mean you can't grow anything but you can consider any possibility so in Bordeaux you're going to grow you know those particular grapes but here you can grow a Russian grape an Italian grape a Portuguese grape and you know, whatever um a, you know one of the noble grapes a hybrid um and uh you know, the, um, um, Lucy um, my, um, Morton, who I've been talking to, uh, she's working on something right now, and they're actually uh, growing it in at um, uh, Cornell, um, and, and finding a grape that used to be in the United States and ended up in France. They're trying to bring it back and, and recultivate it here in France. So, you know, there's, it's, it's a whole changing world. It, it really is. For sure. I can remember, I'm trying to remember if it's in New Zealand or Australia, but one of them, when some of the English settlers came, they brought along, you know, like rabbits or something for hunting yeah. and, you know, loosed a plague upon whatever country yeah. this was where the rabbit wasn't 
wasn't native. I think that's true of deer in New Zealand too, which is now the biggest exporter of deer meat to Germany. So, you know, there's all this weird stuff. I think that the pandemic kind of illustrated for us that some of these overstretched supply chains have, yeah. have serious consequences yeah. um, and disrupting the whole global supply chain, such as the mm -hmm. current uh, battle in the Ukraine has yeah. some serious effects. That's the breadbasket of Europe, don't forget. I mean, wait till, you know, that starts to, um, you know. Well, once upon a time, Egypt was the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. And then, you know, things okay. came along and really messed that up. So Israel yeah, was yeah. once a green and fertile land. It wasn't yeah, really yeah. a desert, so. Yeah, did yeah. I tell you, um, when I, years ago when I was, actually I was writing uh, Ghost Image, which was the other book in my Sophie Medina series, I went to, um, after reading an article, I think it's Smithsonian, um, I ended up, I went back to England and there is a place, there's this, it's called the Millennial Seed Bank and Millennium Seed Bank, and it's outside of London and they are frantically collecting seeds from all over the world and storing them. And they've got them below ground in a place that um, you have to go in with a, you know, you have to go in with like a polar suit and you can't stand longer than like five minutes or something or alarms go off, but they are storing as many seeds as they possibly can in case of the unthinkable. And they're, you know, they're labeling them and they're, they're, they're trying to get seeds before they become extinct. And um, also trying to find old seeds and figure out how they could germinate, you know, so does it need heat? Does it need cold? Does it, what does it need? So it's, it's one of the most fascinating places I've ever visited in my life. It's I'm sure it is. And the original one was in Greenland because, you know, that's the, um, that's crops and it's in the ice. And I think it's, if it's Greenland, it's, it's un, the, uh, millennial sea bank is, is seas and things like that, but the crops is underground in the ice and it's in the, it's in Greenland, I think, or someplace up there. All right, maybe. But yeah, there's two there. So there's the two places. Yeah, which is a, a really worthy endeavor. I mean, what do you do? It's, you know, it doesn't have to be atomic warfare or whatever. It could be fire. You know, it could be a whole lot of things that um, would destroy whatever the native stuff is. And yeah. you would want to have a seed bank to help replenish all that. I yeah. mean, who, you know, I mean, they, did you notice there's a book out, a recent book, maybe, maybe this month about the impact of the meteor and the reason that it killed off not just the dinosaurs but killed off nearly everything oh really um, yeah and, and and because it when it struck in the place it struck it released a stunning amount i'm trying to remember it was of nitrogen or sand whatever it hit you know in the caribbean and and the velocity that at which it hit and the place that it hit released this enormous poisonous clouds of gas into the atmosphere that drifted then and basically wiped out everything, you know, everything living in its path. Yeah. Um, and and a lot of it cleared the decks so yeah. that when it finally settled, the mammals, little mammals, mm -hmm. compared to dinosaurs, the mammals had a chance to then thrive because, um, you know, these other species had been wiped out. So it, it, there's a, a cycle in the yeah. history of the world that um, we are seeing repeating right now. We're just accelerating it, yep. that's what we're doing. Yep. Um, but you know, the question's inevitably going to arise at what temperatures can people live at what temperatures can you know grapes grow, whatever, yeah. if the world keeps heating up at some point, it's going to, um, you know, have well, a- I think, about, I think about you in Arizona, and I, I remember being, you know, being out there in the summer in August when I had a book out, and, the guys at the hotel wouldn't even let me walk the one block from the hotel to the store without a bottle of water because they were afraid I'd pass out. It was so hot. And that was years ago and it's gotten even hotter, hasn't it? Well, no, it actually has stayed just about the same. Um, it really has. Pretty hot. There's, a, there's, there's so many things that we could do. Um, you know, there, there's, there are projects underway to do things like make roofs green so mm -hmm. they don't reflect heat back into the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. can coat roads with... Um, with rubber that they can make from discarded tires and all and try to cut down on all of that. You know, I'm, I'm not even talking about emissions and so forth. I'm talking mm -hmm. about reflected stuff, yeah. you know, concrete roadways, um, yeah. that kind of thing that uh, create a heat sink. So when you have a metropolitan area like Phoenix, um, it, it heats up. And the problem is once it does that, none of that concrete and all the rest of it releases the heat. So it stays, it stays too hot. Um, and that that's something that we actually could in part fix 
if yeah. you know we got around to it yeah. um, in time is there a lot of ways to reduce uh, the problem but yeah. there isn't any way to deal with stuff like you know the pine borer killing off the forests and and that kind of thing which provides tinder which allows for more fires but then maybe you know in the nature of things maybe if there are huge spas taken out by fire there's a rebirth that's possible that's not very helpful if you live in that area you know oh, if you just yeah, lost your yeah. home or your or yeah. your you know your vineyard or your land and all then you know that's a high price for you to be paying but yeah. uh, there's a, a renewal cycle that probably is going on yeah. um and it'll be remember when they had the yellowstone fire and there was a huge debate um about whether uh to let it burn mm -hmm. or whether to try to contain it and um i think eventually they let it burn because it you know there was so much stuff on the ground that allowed this fire in part to prosper and it was better to just burn it all away yeah and then yeah. try to do better forest management so you know it's it's um it's a really deep and interesting question, but we haven't talked about the people in this book. We're talking about the vines. We're I know. We're, the well, this is a really heavy sort of. Oh. It is. Um, I, I didn't really mean to go there, but here we are. So um, Lucy and Quinn, um, the, the storm's going to disrupt their marriage, but mm -hmm. inevitably there is um, so much friction over this black goo and so much blame going around that somebody somebody dies mm -hmm. um i can't remember she doesn't die all that early on does she isn't it no no and i you know i, I was wondering about that because i knew it was late and i just you know i talked to my editor about it and she was okay with it and i i'm in this critique group i don't know if you know there's five of us we've met every single month without fail for 11 years wow yep yep yep, yep. and if we can't meet on say like everybody's got something going on in May or there's a lot of conferences. We'll meet at the beginning of April and the end of April and call the end of April, May. But we've met every single month for, for five years, uh, sorry, 11 years. And um, so I talked to them about it and, and everybody was like, well, you know, you, I mean, you can do it. And so the murder doesn't take place till well into the story. And I kept thinking, how can I move it back? You know, what can I cut out? But I just left it. And um, you know, it it is it is. I didn't, I didn't intend that as a criticism at all. No, no, no. I, mean, I know, no, no, no. I know, but but it's but I definitely thought about it because you really kind of want the you know the pace to sort of take off and 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 people to have you know you want the momentum to go and so to keep it that late that was that was definitely a, you know a decision that I that I and I I debated it. So it's interesting that you know that you would you would bring it up because it was something. Well, that I think this particular story you have to lay a lot more groundwork. Yeah. Um, you know, to yeah. there are stories where you can, in fact, knock off somebody on the first page and then it unspools from yeah, there. <laughs> but there, there are other stories. And I think myself, it's boring, you know, in a series to have everything always happen the same way. Right. So, yeah. you know, I think that the record, I think the absolute record for delaying the appearance of the murder victim is held by Deborah Crombie, who was 156 pages in. I when <laughs> when the victim dies and yeah. you know but it worked brilliantly yeah in yeah. that particular book yeah. um yeah so, he's a good friend we're next to each other on bookshelves all the time <laughs> from, yeah, from yeah. Yeah. but you know i mean i thought it's one of her most interesting books yeah. um and it, it's good to do you know to do something different That's um yeah. and i think the the emotional resonance of of this death would not be the same if you had rushed it if you hadn't laid all the groundwork Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that the 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 death would would have the same impact on everybody. Well, I think you get you know sort of the 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 whole question. I always find this so interesting is like how much do you trust somebody you know and love, and where you know can, you know one of the Quinn is one of the suspects in the in the death of this woman, and she 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 wanted to see him, and he went to see her, and she was gone. So he feels the guilt that had he gotten there sooner, that maybe whatever however you know whatever happened to her he could have prevented it so he's feeling all this guilt and then and then he's clearly not telling lucy something and they're a week away from their marriage and you know what doesn't she know and and do you just how much can you can you trust somebody you love and i, I think that's that's a real you know that's that's sort of a thread that's been woven through a lot of my books is because for me a lot of that story a lot of the series is about family and what always sort of motivated me is why Lucy gets involved is something happens to someone she loves. And so 
you love somebody, you trust them, and then it's a small town too. So, and then so then you're betrayed, and and how does that reverberate through the town? So I, I I I just find that a really fascinating subject, especially you know now when you fake news and what can you trust, and people say things, and they just think if you just keep saying it enough, you know, mud sticks, and you just go on, and um, you just wait for the next news cycle, you know. Um, so I, I just find that absolutely fascinating. Well, the other question I think that's coming more and more to the fore is consequences and mm -hmm. what's the nature of justice. Lisa Scottolini and I had a long discussion about that last night. You know, right. uh, what's the difference between justice and the law? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's clear that there's been an increasing separation. Um, yep. And, you know, people have flagrantly broken the law, but have not been brought to justice. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so part of it is how much do we trust our legal system? How much do we trust the people, you know, that we expect to enforce it? Um, you know, living in Washington, it just feels like it's right on top of us. Yeah. I don't know if it's the proximity to the D.C. or what, or the fact that our local news is also national news, but it, and, and so many, I mean, you know, everybody you know, I mean, not everybody, but so many people where I live work for the government. They work, you know, they're involved in, in something um, to do with the government. And so it's, it's just very pervasive here and you it feels like you can't get away with it and it seems to me that it might be a little bit less the further away from the epicenter you know of Washington that you go that you you're sort of aware of it but it's not as like on top of you as it is here. no I don't think so I think the erosion of public trust has been tremendous oh, yeah. um, and um and I'm not sure it's a wound that we can recover from but okay. you know it's a larger scale of what you're talking about in the book you know how do, how much can you trust or how much do you know the people that you love, but mm -hmm. then you also have to ask, you know, how much can you trust the people? And in theory, you're supposed to be looking after you. Yeah. You know, this whole defund the police thing, for example. You yeah. know, I mean, you expect them to um, maintain order and risk their lives, and um, you know, in in a very dangerous job. And yeah. yet, um, you know, there's always a downside to it. And you know, which of us knows how we'd behave in a in a split second situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are, yeah, you know, there there's so many different variables and it is really hard to yeah. I had um, a lawyer friend who used to say, there but for the grace of God go any of us on any given day. Yeah. Well I often I wonder, not, yeah. right. Well I often wonder why anybody would want actually to take a job like that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, because the downsides of it are very difficult. But I think many people, many people are really, you know, think that that keeping order, keeping people safe, you know, going, establishing rules and living by them is, is still important. Yeah. And I'm going to be really interesting to see because I think that's where this chasm has mm -hmm. to a great degree arisen. Mm -hmm. And I, I would be really interested to see if that holds, you know, if the mm -hmm. center, so to mm -hmm. speak, can hold in the face of absolutely yes. willful yeah. violation. I mean, you live near Washington where it's a disaster. We live in Arizona, which is, I live in Arizona, which is another place just absolutely riddled with people who seem to be yeah. living on a third planet. Well, um, we, have, we haven't touched the um, the third rail also that I wrote about. I'm sort of waiting for you to get around it, but the, the dismantling of the Confederate monuments, which took place during my, while I was writing the book, and that's what I had um, Lucy's brother was involved in. So there's just, there's a lot of you know, sort of third rail issues that I went near in this book, I think. You know, that that was hard to, to understand. Can you repeat that? Um, that, base, that while I was writing the book, it was the summer where the Confederate monuments were being defaced and then they were all being pulled down. And so I felt like I had to get into that. And again, I had, you know, I had a lot of conversations with my agent, with my editor, with the critique group. And, and you know, a, a couple of people said, like, you, you don't need to do that. And I, but I really felt like I did. So, um, so what I had, so um, Lucy's brother has gone down to Richmond when they're, and he's, he's biracial um, and um, has taken, has, you know, taken the monuments down. And what I set up in the book is when I started writing this book in, in 2000, I mean, I'm a New Englander and I didn't know anything about the Civil War, most of which was fought in Virginia. So I kind of learned as I was, as I was going along, as I was writing. And I set up some things that were true to the character her family had owned slaves. Um, they were on the side of the South. Um, you know, they were Confederates and proud of it. And so I had to live with that when I got to this part of the book. And so I, you know, it took me a really, really long time to figure out how I was going to write. I just, I just thought it had to be there about 
the dismantling of the Confederate monuments and what it had meant to Virginia and how it was having an impact on uh, on, on everything, you know, I mean, all around me, all this, there's schools are changing names, streets are changing names, highways are changing names. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. So um, that ended up in there too. I just felt like I had to write about it. Well, I don't think you can ignore it. I mean, there again, I think the journalist in you, you know, is never going to be completely squelched. And so if you're being kind of a witness to, you know, what's going on, you want to put it in your books, then, yeah. um, you know, I think it's important. I mean, I lived in Virginia for a while yeah, and yeah. Um, I can remember very much the sort of Monument Row in Richmond, you know, mm -hmm. that whole swath that you would drive yeah. along and there would be, yeah. and in fact, I don't remember how it works, but there was a whole language of horses because almost all of the statues, a huge number of them were generals or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. officers, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they're all astride because that was how, you know, how they operated. And there was a, a language to horses about, you know, the hooves and whether these were people who died or these were people who were victorious yeah, yeah, or I yeah. can't remember what, but, you know, there was like a, a code of, um, yeah, code yeah, for the horses. Um, and, you know, um, there you go. I'm, I'm going to try to show you something if I can. So when I was researching this, um, Don Andrews, who's in my critique group and uh, lives up the street from me, had a friend who's now a photographer in New York. And um, I, um, she said, you know, he's come, he's went down to Richmond and he took all these photographs and he's crowdfunding sort of a soft cover book. And if he gets enough money, he'll, he'll, um, he'll publish a hardcover. So I funded him. And um, so I got a, a copy of the book and I, I'm going to see if I can do this. These are the monuments. Can you, can you... Wow. Yep. Is that, can you see it? So, I mean, that's, it was, there was a lot of anger. And then they, they, put, they pulled them all down. The one they pulled down in Leesburg, which is the town near me, um, which has always been in my book, they did it in the dead of night. They just, one, one morning. Well, you know, one of the questions, I mean, aside from all the political and social issues involved is, you know, is what about the art? I mean, if we, if we had that attitude, many of the world's great art treasures wouldn't even yeah. exist now. You know, because art art also reflects its time and its and its era. And where and do you stop too? You know, how far do you go? When we went to Charlotte, we were drove down to Charlottesville to the book festival two weeks ago. We we got um we, we it's always this one hotel where you stay and all everything takes place on the pedestrian mall. But you pull up and there's a statue of Lewis and Clark. And I said to my husband, I think that statue's gone. So it's like, what did Lewis and Clark? Do? I mean, I had forgotten. But there, you know, how how much are you going to take this all away and what are you going to do with it, you know, and are people going to, do you want something else to go there? What, you know, what do you want to happen? And um, Andre reminded me, my husband reminded me of this, and I wrote about it in the book, of this um, place in Moscow when they took down all the statues of all the communists leaders, Lenin and Stalin and everything else. They sort of threw them in a, in a park along the Moscow River, and now they've turned it into a big, um, it's called the, the, the Park of the Fallen Monuments, and they start, they've added all these other things, and so they've kind of taken away of the taken away the the meaning of the, it's not just an homage to the, the communist era but there's so many other things there people go rollerblading and they have picnics and there's yoga class and all that stuff so you know what are you going to do with that part of your heritage and your history i think they're very complicated questions and um it's too bad that social media the internet does not allow reflection anymore yes yes unfiltered comments are just well it's not just, yeah i mean it, they, there's this constant you know kind of crisis mode because and you know the media is not exempt for it it's all clicks mm -hmm. and they can't turn themselves away i mean they yep. can't turn themselves away from trump you know because it's just clickbait um yep. and, yep. and i i think as you pointed out earlier when we were talking that you know, stuff like, you know, Instagram has changed so dramatically where it used to be, you know, a pleasant place where you could go and share photos. And now it's either commercial or, you know, much of it is filled with political messages or buy my products or whatever. Um, and I, I don't think, I don't think that we are living in a time when, when actions can be considered with any, yeah. um, at deliberate speed. And so, you know, wise decisions can be made. Instead, you know, we seem to swing into outrage and, you know, and make, I mean, it's, it, 
the advice has always been if you lose somebody important to you, someone in your family dies, let's say one of your parents dies or something, or your second parent dies, the, the wisdom is always you should wait a year, you know, before you make any dramatic mm -hmm. changes or decisions. Mm -hmm. If you lost mm -hmm. your spouse, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that was to allow a period of reflection and really think about things yeah. and not make a hasty disposition of things that you might later truly regret. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and that that leisure is more and more evaporating. Well, the other thing that really concerns me, and, and I'm, I'm partway through a book, it's pretty dense. It's not as um, easy a book to get through as I had thought it would be, but it's called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brain. And I've been really interested in, you know, figuring out like how I'm, how I've changed and how I've been manipulated and like what I can do to sort of, you know, sort of cut the cord and not be so sucked into um, the whole social media, you know, you, I mean, you can, you can spend a day and all of a sudden you look around and what have you done, you know, scrolled and scrolled and scrolled. And well, I solved the problem neatly because I don't do it. I mean, you. I don't belong to Facebook. But you know, I, I don't see that's, I don't think we have that luxury. I mean, so today I went on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to, you know, um, say that, you know, I was going to be here tonight so that people would know. And I can't, you know, but I think I get punished, especially on Facebook, because I'm rarely there. So like, if you don't go on that often, and my son works for Meta, um, one of my sons. Um, so, if, you know, if you don't go on that much, it's like, well, no one's going to see it. We're going to punish you. And there's your algorithm. So I don't know. That's, that's crazy. Well, I, I professionally, I do the Instagram for the bookstore as I my own contribution. Um, Patrick does Facebook and another staff member does Twitter and mm -hmm. so forth. But I don't have any personal social media and other than posting things on inter Instagram, I don't, minor, minor I don't look at anything and it saves me an enormous amount of angst and mm -hmm. uh, once or twice, you know, there have been attacks. We supported an author and been um, unfortunately uh, and totally unfairly. God, I think the word is doxed, but I can't remember for sure if that's even the right. Anyway, there's all sort of outrage that rolled, you know. I think I know what her. you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and so it wasn't me personally. Um, I was offended for her. And, you know, I, I deleted the post and then I put it back up again to get rid of all the nasty comments. And, and mm -hmm. sure enough, the storm blew over. And most of the people that were doing that actually didn't have any personal stake in it. I know, I know. Um, they just wanted to pile on to something yes, they yes, thought would yes. be. Yep, and yep. if you if you go and, I mean, every once in a while, just somehow or other, there'll be something on Instagram. And I will look at the comments. And most of them are just insane. They're mm -hmm. completely pointless. And furthermore, the people who made them are not even doing it under their real name. So there's no meaning to any of them. I know, I know. So why why spend my time on it is my attitude. I agree, I agree. I still love beautiful pictures though. So I, and I love looking at, you know, there's I, like the, the travel places. There's right now with the cherry blossoms in Washington, there's so many gorgeous pictures of Washington. It's I so- I know, it is beautiful. And I really enjoy putting the puppies up, you know, it's oh, kind of fun. Yeah. Um, but we probably dissuaded you with this slightly more political discussion than I <laughs> ever thought about. Um, <laughs> But Bitterroots is actually um, a delightful book. And it does, as all of Ellen's books do, she always handles social issues and economic issues. And in her other series, um, not just the Moscow-based one, but um, the one about the photographer, I think you've done a wonderful job bringing in Washington history. So before we call it, Patrick, are you writing something new with your photographer? I am, I am, and it's um, it's about it's about uh, uh, Washington history. It's actually it's um, about the murder of an associate justice of the Supreme Court, um, which I started writing before any of before Breyer stepped down and everything else. So, and then also about homelessness. Ah, well, I think that's great. Are you are the older books in that series going to be reprinted? So um, my edit, my agent went to um, Simon & Schuster and asked for the rights back for the first two books. And then my new publisher um, bought them and um, has reissued both um, Multiple Exposure and Ghost Image in um, trade paperback. And they came cool. out February 1st. So they, they, they're just kind of, in, I would say like, they said, well, they're there if anybody wants them. But when the new, when the new book comes out, I'm turning it in in September. Um, so it'll be out in 2023. And um, he said, but they'll, they, ha they have the whole series now. So it was, it was kind of cool that they did that. And especially considering 
I wrote those books in like 2014 and 2015, I think, as they came out in 2015 and 2016. So the hiatus between the last book and the new book is going to be eight years. And I, you know, I'm eternally grateful to Dominic, to my agent and my editor that they had enough faith in me that I could pull this off and come, you know, make a comeback after eight years. So we'll see. I read something for Jungle Reds, Dems Crombie asked me to write about what is it like, you know, will people follow you? Um, after um, after you you know had this hiatus and the story that I wrote was about a loon that had landed in a little tiny pond um, accidentally got sort of distracted and, and ended up in this this pond in suburban Fairfax near where I live and the loon could not take off from the pond because the pond was too small so there's all of a sudden it has a Facebook page and everybody wants to get the loon to a bigger pond so they brought in a scientist and another guy and they got a boat and in the middle of the night they went out and threw a, a, a bag over the loon's head and captured it and moved it to the bigger pond so it had a run a bigger runway so my question is like Am I going to get a big enough runway to take off with this book when it comes out next year? So I'm hoping the answer is yes. And I got so many affirmative um, comments on that Jungle Reds post that said, of course that you're going to. I mean, people are going to read for the books. They don't, you know, they're, you know, people will follow you. So we'll see. Well, I think a lot of people will discover the book. And then if they're really interested, they can go back and read the two earlier ones. Yeah. But I don't think you should think that the success of the book will be dependent on yeah you know, on the two earlier ones, but it'd be nice to have them if people, you well, know, the other thing is, you know explore. I took a break. I did, I wrote six of, um, six of the books in the wine series. And then I was, I was done. I, I just, I needed a break. So I wrote these other two books and that was a five-year hiatus. Then I came back to, to the series again and I wrote six more. And I think, you know, you have to sort of write, you know, you, you need like the energy and the juice. And I, I just felt like I, I kind of wrote the end in this one and I'm, I will never say never, but I'm just, ready to be done now for a while and or maybe permanently I don't know but well, you, know. you got them to the you know a place that you've been heading for for quite a while and yeah. you know there, there are plenty of other interesting things to write about you do Pardon. live for all of the um excitement and so forth you do you do live in a really interesting area you yeah. know with lots yeah. and lots of history lots of action and all so why not write about it Patrick yeah. why don't we call you up and see if there's any comments you'd like to make or questions all right, let's see. Um, any actual questions? You have a lot of a lot of fans and, and readers watching. Um, oh, thank you. And making nice thank comments. You all. Yeah, I don't see too many actual questions. Just people really like the series. Um, one question you've already addressed: Will there be more Lucy Montgomery books, um, mm -hmm. or do you have any interest in writing something completely different, a new series, perhaps, or? I, I do, actually, and I, again, I talked about that with my agent and my editor. Did you try again? <laughs> Technology. <laughs> and, Ruined um, the theater. <laughs> oh, but um, I've just got a lot of things going on in my personal life right now. My, my husband is not well, and so I'm, um, I'm kind of, I don't think I have it in me to write to start something new and have all that energy. And th this book, actually, we haven't talked about this, Barbara, but I'm sure you've talked about it with other authors. This is the first book I've written totally during COVID. Yeah. And I get so much of my energy from going out. I need to be in the place. I need to, you know, what I need to be there at the right time of year. Like, what, you know, what, what are the sounds you hear? What, is, what do you smell? What's in the air? What, you know, all five senses. And to not go out was really different. And so that's why this book was different. I wasn't sure how, you know, what kind of reception it would get because it's, it just it just felt different um so i um i i think hopefully when we start getting back to whatever the new normal is um you know i i would like i still would i'd like to write a standalone and try something different i really would well you just have to wait until the time is right you know yeah. um yeah yeah and, and it'll be interesting to see what you do i didn't ask you about that because that's a that's a question that for some authors is a hard one to address yeah. So, you know, I how did I, I spend the pandemic? Right. What oh, yeah, did you do for me? I've heard, I've heard from a lot of people and like my agent used to call me every week and he was like, good, you can still write. And, um, but I've heard people who said that, you know, we live in a pandemic world anyway. We're just so solitary. I mean, it's like, what changed? Not much. You know, it's just that everybody's working from home now, but writers are, you know, a lot of us are introverts and we just, we're used to just being at our desk. I mean, I'm happiest when I'm here at my desk writing. And it's, I find it sort of hard to actually go out and do events because I'm such an introvert. And um, so um, it, 
but I did miss getting out and doing the research because that is that just fuels me. That's just so, you know, and talking to people and learn picking up all the little things that, you know, that that sort of make the book richer and, and deeper and that you wouldn't know. It's like, well, I could do that, you know, and, and so that you can go back and weave the plot together again. Um, who do you like to read? That's one of the questions that's come in. Who are some of your favorite writers? Oh gosh, I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, I, you know, I just I read a lot, I guess. Um, right now I'm reading Eric Larson's The Splendid and the Vile, which is wonderful. He's such a good writer. Um, I just interviewed three authors for the um, Virginia Book Festival and I, and I read their books, which were terrific. Alma Katsu's Red Widow, wonderful book, loved it. Mm -hmm. It's about a mole and, you know, a, a Russian mole in the CIA, um, which was of course right up my alley. And then I read Kelly Garrett's um, Like a Sister, which was terrific. And Naomi Harahara's um, um, Clark, Clark and Division, Clark and Division, which was great. And to get to talk to them and find out the, the backstories for those books was really, really interesting. Um, so that was a it was a great it was a great panel at the, at the at the book festival. So that's that's sort of my and I just finished Lara Prescott's The Secret We Kept again about it's more Russia, but um, about the CIA based on the true story of the CIA plot to bring um, to smuggle Dr. Zhivago back into Russia because um, Pasternak had not been allowed to publish it there. So interesting. Well, that's about it for actual questions. Okay. Well, thank yeah. you all. Well, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Um, I miss yeah. you. I'm sorry. I miss you, you too. I, I know. know. Ellen's been here so many times, so we've done fun things like go to the botanical garden and you know other it. stuff. And we had some um, great meals and shared wine. Bought well, glass of wine. They'll come around again. You know, in the meantime, well. it's been grand to have a, a very nice conversation thank with you. you. And I will certainly look forward to seeing your book next year because I I thought the the two that you wrote were excellent. Um, remind you. me, remind us of the titles. M multiple exposure and ghost image, two photography type terms. Yeah. yeah. And the new one, I I think the new one right now the tentative title of the new one is Blow Up. There you are. Wonderful. Anyway, we do have signed copies left of Bitter Roots, and um, Thank I you. hope that we've interested you enough to buy one. Um, I, I really, I really enjoyed it a lot, and I've liked the whole series. Um, I do think, I do think that right now it's in a good place, and if you want to move on and do something else for a bit, yeah. that your fans will be okay with that. Thank so. you. Yeah. We'll talk next year. Right. Okay, thanks. Bye, everybody. Thanks Love for joining us. Take care, yeah. you guys. Miss you. Bye. Bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.